I grew up um, in the mainline Presbyterian church, and we did not, um, I, I would say, it, functionally speaking, was very cessationist. We didn't have any, you know, I can't recall any times anybody spoke in tongues or anything like that, although the pastor, after years of, of discussing with him, is certainly not a cessationist, the pastor that I grew up with. Um, the, he, he was a pastor while I was growing up there at the church. Nevertheless, it wasn't as if there those types of things were encouraged or practiced in that congregation. Um, and so when I encountered the theological view of cessationism, it felt more normal to me and understandable. But I wouldn't have had any theological underpinnings for it. Now, some people might say, well, the cessationist view, I can imagine some continuationists would think that the cessationist view is not really well thought out. It's just people are uncomfortable mm -hmm. with these types of uh, spiritual gifts and activities, and therefore they have constructed some artifice of a theological view just to not have to encounter things that would make them mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Have you encountered that, or did you used to think that yourself? I didn't think that myself. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and I didn't know anything different. You know, every uh, Sunday, every worship service, there was some sort of manifestation of the Spirit, whether it be in the form of tongues or prophecy or, you know, prayers for uh, miracles or miraculous healings of some sort. It was sort of the expected thing, and at least the hoped-for thing. You would pray for these things and um, hope to see a manifestation of the Spirit, a move of the Spirit of some sort. So um, I was not uncomfortable with that because I grew up in that environment. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and when I started to rethink through my Pentecostal theology with regard to the gifts of the Holy Spirit in particular, it was a very, very difficult thing because I was leaving an experience. I was coming out of a church where I had had all these kinds of experiences and had thought, believed I had spoken in tongues for many years and so on. So um, uh, there was not that foreignness to me. I was very comfortable with it, and I was very uncomfortable leaving that setting initially. And, of course, we, uh, you know, the Pentecostals, uh, the group that I was in, anyhow, uh, took Scripture very seriously. They had a high view of the Bible. They believed it to be the Word of God, and whatever Scripture um, said, they wanted to experience. And, you know, they wanted to experience what the apostles experienced on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, uh, which the Samaritans later experienced through the ministry of Philip in chapter 8, and Cornelius and his household experienced in, in Acts chapter 10, and the Ephesian uh, believers in Acts chapter 19, whenever they received the Holy Spirit and, and prophesied. So they wanted, uh, you know, Pentecostals want to experience this gift of the Holy Spirit and the different gifts, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, uh, because they believe it is biblical, or at least, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to experience too growing up when I became a believer and what I sought for and prayed for. And so how to understand the biblical data and um, to think through that from a different viewpoint, from a biblical theological viewpoint, and understanding the uniqueness of what's going on in the book of Acts was very new to me. Yeah, I can imagine many continuationists would see that and say, well, these things happened in the Bible, mm -hmm. and if I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and we pray even the inerrant, infallible Word of God— mm -hmm. God is telling us he does these things. So if you don't believe God is doing these things, then the, the thought is, well, then you must be some form of a liberal who doesn't actually believe God's word and thinks it is myth or mm -hmm. various forms of, of uh, stories meant to teach us something, but not in a literal way. And that can necessarily be the fear that continuationists might think that cessationists automatically are playing fast and loose with Scripture, and that they are, do not hold it to be the inspired and inerrant Word of God. Another thing I, I have encountered in the past, even in my ministry, as a minister, I have preached um, sermons that touched on subjects regarding the Holy Spirit. We, we preach on the doctrines of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's personality and what He does. He, mm -hmm. not just a force, but what He specifically does is third person, third member of the Trinity— 
And I had somebody say, well, I'm very thankful, you know, that, that here even at this Reformed Church that you believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's like, well, yes, we all do. Maybe we don't speak about him as often as we ought to, but that's the other thought that there can be, that if you're not right. Pentecostal, then you don't believe the Holy Spirit exists, or if he does exist, then he has basically no function. He's just kind of right. hanging out. Yes, that's true. And all of these are... are reasonable responses to what people experience or what they think about. Um, but the really, the response is out of ignorance in terms of what a cessationist view actually is. And I'm not saying that pejoratively. It's just a lack of knowledge. 